Good evening and welcome to this online lecture, which was, will take us on a little fashion journey to the Renaissance and beyond. This online expert talk is part of the flamboyant fake series of lectures organized by the House of European History. Thank you all for being with us tonight and special thanks to Professor Sophie Pittman. Clothes, we all wear them. And consciously or not, we bend to the convention of fashion. Why do women wear skirts and most men don't? Why do we follow dress codes? After all, these practices are just inventions. Different societies and cultures have different dress norms and they are mostly unwritten. However, they have a social significance with different rules and expectations depending on the occasion. Certain brands, fabrics or materials might help us conveniently place people in a specific social class. Clothing can also uh, demonstrate your culture, mood, mood, level of confidence, interests, your age perhaps, or your values. By dressing up, we can give ourselves an image. For example, a man with a suit or tie is most likely viewed as a businessman, or if he happens to be walking in this particular area of Brussels, where we are now, a Eurocrat. Clothes can, of course, be political symbols as well. If we just think, for example, about the jeans, a symbol for the West during the times of Cold War. Clothes we wear have determined for hundreds of years how we are viewed by others. More often than not, we jump to conclusions about others based on their attire. But before judging someone, should we not ask ourselves what is real and what is fake? Is the person really what we think? Do we see the real personality or just an image he or she projects? And does the outside appearance even matter for the relationship we create with this person? Tonight, we will explore how during the Renaissance period, Im imitations of expensive tissues provided the non-elite with fashionable clothes within a budget and in line with sumptuary laws that often restricted the use of fine materials. Ingenious techniques created a luxury appearance for those who are not allowed to wear the most expensive clothes. I'm very curious to learn how faking these attires had an impact on people's self-perception and the perception by others. Was the imitation worthwhile? Did it allow them to enhance their own owner's place in society? Did it contribute to making clothing more democratic or would that be anachronistic to think so? I'm very curious, therefore, to listen to our expert tonight, Sophie Pittman. Sophie Pittman is a Leverholm Early Career, Career Fellow at University College London, where she explores the history of early modern clothing and its relationship to the weather and the environment. Previously, she did research on the refashioning the Renaissance project at Aalto University. She has published works on sumptuary law, issues of luxury and the everyday, and reconstruction as a methodology. She combines traditional sources, source analysis of texts and images with the close study of surviving objects and hands-on experimental methods. Our talk tonight will be moderated by Johanna Urbanek, lead curator of the Fake For Real temporary exhibition. I wish you all a very nice evening and a fruitful debate. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you very much, Constance and Joanna, for um, the kind introduction and invitation to speak today. And I would really like to extend those thanks uh, to the House of European History for inviting me to speak about fake fashions in concert with the Fake for Real History of Forgery and Falsification exhibition. Now, for those of you who've had a chance to see the exhibition in person, you might recall that fashion is represented in a display filled with fakes of some of the most lucrative and successful brands on the market today, such as Lacoste and Burberry. Now, some of these objects are made to the highest material standards. What is fake about them is no more than the fact that their logo has not been legitimately applied and endorsed by the fashion house. Others are poorer quality simulations, liable to fall apart after just one wash, or featuring a subtle misspelling on the label that warns a careful observer that the item is not quite the Rolex watch or Adidas sneaker that it purports to be. 
But as we will see today, fashion and fakery have a much longer history. One that stretches back to a time well before globally recognized fashion houses could copyright brand logos. And in today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on the 16th and 17th centuries, an era in which you will see fashion was full of fakery and materials were not always what they seemed. Now the early modern period or the Renaissance period as some, some call it, is often characterized as an era of sumptuous luxury with rich velvets, shining pearls and gold ornament. Fashions like these that you see before you were extreme. So we see both men and women dressed in yards of lace to trimmed ruffs, lush furs and elaborately underpropped skirts. Now, the revolution of dress in this era was largely sculptural, thanks in part to new light fabrics and cutting edge tailoring techniques. Clothes were not just made of cloth that draped over a human form, but instead could be shaped with tailoring stitches, with glues and starches, and with inner structural materials that created new silhouettes for the body. These might be critiqued for their duplicity, in his extraordinary depiction of the visual strategies and attire of mankind, entitled Anthropometamorphosis, a London physician named John Bulwer criticized most nations for altering their bodies with what he called artificial and affected deformations. Now, half a century earlier, an anonymous pamphleteer had similarly critiqued deforming fashions, as he called them, singling out flapping breeches for spiteful forgery, which he claimed unfashioned God's form, playing on this dual meaning of the word fashion that could mean to make or to create, as well as a shifting style. And you see in these portraits, um, a codpiece uh, here in the center, that might be seen as a, a deformity or a forgery of the, the body beneath. Um, and these some flapping breeches on the right that really go well beyond um, and really hide the leg of, of their wearer. And I think what portraits also remind us was that fashions could be just as elaborate uh, for men as, as women in this era. So clearly fashion was connected with fakery in the minds of early modern critics. And today I'm going to be focusing less on the power of clothing to alter the human form and instead zooming in to examine the very materials and techniques used to make and fake fashionable dress and accessories. But I think it's important to foreground the moral questions around fashion, the body and artifice. And by the word artifice, we must remember that in this period, this really directly meant things skillfully created by man rather than nature and God. This shows the cultural power of clothing and appearances and the tension between the admiration for the skill of the human hand and a fascination and reverence for the natural world as created by God. I'm going to present today some surviving objects that date from this period to show how weavers, goldsmiths, tailors and other enterprising craftspeople cleverly manipulated materials to create clothes and accessories that looked finer than the sum of their parts. I'm also going to discuss some imitations that have been reconstructed following early modern recipe books, which can help us understand how fakes might have operated in the early modern period, even when relatively few fake fashions survive. And I'm also going to discuss the legal, linguistic and cultural meanings surrounding fake fashions to suggest that mimetic imitations were not always regarded as duplicitous immoral fakes, but could sometimes be celebrated in their own right. So while nowadays the price of clothing is determined more by the brand label than the materials and cost of manufacture, in the early modern period, it was the very material that accounted for the vast majority of the expense of a garment. So I've examined bills, um, receipts for, for doublets, uh, like you see here, um, that show that the materials themselves cost about 10 times the price that the tailor charged for actually creating the garment. Now, a black doublet like the one you see on your screen was extremely fashionable. Black was a very hard color to achieve through natural dyes. 
and it could appear quite somber and um, austere, but actually it was quite an exuberant, elaborate fashion because of the challenge in getting a true black. But it was very stylish to show off the black of your outer garment by having a flash of colour in the lining underneath the garment. And you see that this doublet is black on the surface, but inside is lined with some bright yellow silk. However, if you owned a doublet, um, you rarely took it off in polite company. So most of your lining wouldn't be seen and appreciated um, by friends and onlookers. So you could fake the effect of this doublet through ingenious tailoring. So if you couldn't afford to fully line your doublet with silk, you could buy tiny pieces of leftover silk cuttings from traders of fabric scraps. This was a very large market in the period, the, the scrap market. And you could ask your tailor just to put them around the very edges of the sleeve. So when you moved your arm, if somebody caught a glimpse of the lining, they might imagine that your doublet was fully lined with a crimson silk, when actually you'd only have to spend a relatively small amount of money. Now, it wasn't just cost that might limit what you could and could not wear. The very stuff that made up an item of clothing or jewellery fell under legal scrutiny across early modern Europe, as fine fibres and dye stuffs were often restricted by law to the upper end of the social spectrum. So here we see just one act, this one's from 1577 from England, that outlines in some detail the hierarchies of fabrics, colours and decorations in dress. So at the very top, uh, it tells us that silk of the colour of purple and gold um, and cloth of gold and silver was restricted just to the king, queen and their immediate family. And as you go down the list, uh, you see things like that if you want to wear a velvet gown, you need to have at least the status of a knight, for example. Now, similar sumptuary laws were passed all across Europe. And in some cities, there were even fashion police patrolling the streets, handing out fines and punishments to those who repeatedly broke sartorial laws. So given the financial and legal costs of fine materials, and the clear correlation between status and appearance codified by laws and reinforced in everyday culture. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that there was a market for materials that looked finer than they really were. So, for example, uh, the fashionable pattern silk velvet that we see on the right, you might be familiar with this kind of pattern. It's seen in many portraits of the elites, this kind of gold and crimson pomegranate, uh, highly, highly wrought pattern, very fashionable in the era. But it could be mimicked by a block printed linen made sparkling and shimmering through the application of mica on the left. This was much quicker to produce, it was made of cheaper materials, and it would have been legally permissible for a far larger market, but it still participates in the fashionable design and shimmering surface effect of the item on the right. Now, silk velvets were really the height of expense and fashion in the period, and they could be imitated in other ways too. Enterprising weavers could simulate a silk velvet using wool and linen blends, which cut down not only on the cost of the fabric in a significant way, silk was phenomenally expensive compared to wool and linen, but it also made it legally permissible for those lower down the social spectrum who were prohibited by law from wearing silk velvet, but who could wear a lesser wool or a linen. Now, surviving examples uh, like the one you see before you of mock velvet might be what was known as mockado in the period. And these examples show just how effective mixed textiles could be. They could be fairly successful imitations, uh, so much so that we have examples of the elite buying these kinds of fabrics in the period and using them in their own dress. And even today, they sometimes fool curators um, who look at the fabric, assume it's made of silk, and without very close examination, or sometimes even scientific testing, we don't know that what we're looking at is actually a mixed blend, sometimes with some silk, but lots of wool, or sometimes just wool and even some linen and hemp too. Now, the fabric um, in front of you um, still has quite an elaborate pattern, and if you were going to weave this pattern, you would need a, a weaver who was 
thoroughly um, skilled and had a lot of time to devote to making the, the fabric. So velvet is one of the most expensive fabrics because the pattern has to be created through the raising and lowering of different warp threads uh, and the insertion of metal rods between each row. And then sometimes uh, by hand, you cut those loops with a razor. So this is highly skilled and it's very slow work. It's also very uh, precarious. So when I've uh, tried to, to weave velvet, I've often completely messed it up. It's, you have to really know what you're doing. But if you wanted to imitate velvet in an even cheaper way um, than just using uh, different kinds of materials, you could also simulate the pattern through the much quicker, cheaper and easier technique of hot stamping, where the pattern is impressed into the surface through a heated metal tool. So you see on the far left of the screen, uh, an example of stamped velvet. Um, and so this has not been woven um, with that pattern. It's just had a hot stamp placed on top of it. Now, this work is not very skilled at all. The Refashioning the Renaissance team were able to reconstruct um, a, a stamping method at the School of Historical Dress in London uh, using just a metal fork that we'd heated over a hot plate. You can see a photograph of that on the right. Now, this technique was so successful um, at imitating pattern that by the 18th century, it had been mechanized uh, using hot, large hot rollers. And you can see that depicted in the middle image uh, in Diderot's Encyclopédie. So it was a very successful imitative technique. Now, we also find lots of other kinds of material fakes, and I'll just take you on a little tour through some of them. So linen could be glazed to look like shining silk using linen smoothers, starches, and hot presses. And, and we have uh, an example of a very beautiful, very, very well-made doublet out of this kind of shiny linen on the left. Beaver hats were highly fashionable. They were often the most expensive item in uh, a fairly wealthy person's wardrobe. And the finest examples of them were made with beaver. They were known um, often as beaver hats. But the effect of beaver, which was by this period endangered and often had to be imported, could be imitated with native sheep's wool that was just highly brushed. So I've uh, tried to reconstruct a beaver hat, but using sheep's wool instead of beaver fur. Um, and it provides a fairly successful imitation some items in museum collections, we don't even know what substance they're made of without significant scientific testing. And so it can be very hard to tell what's an imitation and what's the real thing. Paste gems too, often made from glass and sometimes foil, were highly popular substitutes for precious stones. Now, the only giveaway that this ring uh, that you see in front of you, the only giveaway that it's not really made of diamonds is that the edges of the rock crystal have started to wear away. So now we can see material transformation. It's not quite as hard as a diamond, but it looks very convincing at a distance. Gold and silver gilt lace was an incredibly fashionable and expensive trimming. So here's the doublet with the yellow silk lining again. You can see it's covered in gold braid on the outside. And it was used by the elites to decorate their, their clothing, and often it, it accounted for the greatest expense. It was the most expensive thing um, to, to include in your, in your uh, garment. It was made of a thin, drawn wire wound around a silk core. But this process could be easily imitated by using copper instead of gold metal. So we've got a very rare surviving piece of copper gilt thread round on, around silk at the v and uh, up uh, above you. Now, of course, copper tarnishes in ways that gold doesn't, but when these objects were new, they probably provided fairly successful simulations. There were records of Parisian women renting out wedding outfits to women in rural France uh, for their wedding day, including things like copper lace and jewels painted with enamel to look like gold. So we know that people enjoyed looking like they were wearing gold lace um, and, and real gems, even if they couldn't afford them. Copper substitute for gold lace was also widely used in the theater, so much so that it was associated with acting and performance. In the War of the Theatres, Ben Jonson calls actors copper-laced scoundrels. 
and in Thomas Decker's advice manual for stylish young upstarts called the Gull's Hornbook, he challenges the gallant man to sit on the very stage of the theatre so that he can examine the player's lace up close and win wages upon laying whether it is copper or not. So from this quote uh, from Thomas Decker, it seems like people might have enjoyed going to the theatre and trying to guess what was real and what was fake on the stage. But off stage, deceptive or fictive materials could be perhaps a little more threatening. Imitative materials were often used as similes uh, by moralists and other thinkers to make larger scientific or religious arguments. The Florentine astronomer Galileo Galilei used the example of a simpleton being fooled into seeing copper as gold or silver as a warning about how the senses could lie. For the German reformer Sebastian Frank, however, the falsity of imitation gold stood for fake religion. He says, a thing is all the more wicked and dangerous the more closely it approximates a real thing and yet is not the thing as an alloy and brass approximate silver and gold. So as part of the ERC funded refashioning the Renaissance project, we studied over 600 inventories that record the belongings of members of the artisan classes in Siena, Florence and Venice between 1550 and 1650. And we found quite a large number of materials that were recognized and recorded in official documents as being fakes by the appraisers who took down the inventory. So you see here in this list that I assembled um, that we find represented among these sort of middling classes, fake gold, fake silver, fake cloth of gold, um, fake diamonds, rubies, coral emeralds, and also lots of fabrics that imitated finer ones. So the simulation velvets, um, fake cloth of gold, and so on. Now, as so few of these items survive in museums, we were keen to try alternative methods of studying this clearly widespread but somewhat missing seam of material culture. And so we turned to books of secrets from the Renaissance period, which include countless recipes uh, that promise to create imitation jewels, fake pearls made of shell, powdered glass and fish bones, uh, and painting fur to look like real leopard fur, for example. So we reconstructed a number of these recipes in order to get a better understanding of the meaning of imitation and fake material from the era. And I don't have time to go into all of our experiments today. Uh, so I will refer you uh, to the top right of the screen to um, our website where you can read a lot more and see a film about some of the different processes that we attempted. But today I'll focus on two ex experiments that helped us better understand the effect and interest in imitation materials of the era. So in one of our inventories, a 1646 inventory from Bernardino Campi, he was a cutlery maker from Siena, uh, we learned that he owned a rosary made of fake amber. And so we followed two recipes from the English translation of Rochelle's Secreti. This uh, recipe book was translated into many languages. It was one of the most popular books across Europe, um, books of secrets from the early modern period, because we wanted to see uh, what a fake amber rosary might have looked like. Now, this recipe calls for turpentine to be mixed with raw cotton to imitate amber. By following each step in the recipe, we discovered that the cotton not only gives the sticky oozing turpentine a structural integrity, but it also mimics the striations and imperfections of amber. So I wonder if you can tell on your screen which of those three stones is real amber and which two are the ones that we reconstructed. Rochelle suggests that you pour the paste into little balls and then use these small round uh, balls for, for decorating whatever you like. He suggests you might want to decorate cutlery. So it's interesting that we found um, the uh, mention of fake amber in a cutlery maker's uh, inventory. Um, but you could also make rosary beads as, as it seems like Bernardino might have done. But interestingly, Rochelle describes this artificial amber not exactly as a fake. 
uh, he can, you can see in the title, he just says it, you're going to make stones of amber. And he describes in the recipe that this is another kind of amber that even mimics the material properties of natural amber. So it smells like amber. And he says that when you rub it, it attracts straw. And this, uh, he's what he's hinting at is the triboelectric effect, which is still used today as a means to test real amber. So if you go to a jewelry sh sh store and you want to see whether something's real amber or not, you can rub it, create a little static charge and see whether you could pick up a piece of, of straw or, or paper from the table. So here what we see is this imitation amber is mimicking the material properties as well as the visual effects of amber. And this fake amber could be regarded as very appropriately used even in uh, the most um, sort of the most important religious object owned, owned by a Catholic, uh, the rosary. We also reconstructed recipes that promised to counterfeit pearls that look natural. This was taken from Isabella Cortese's 1584 book of secrets. And the recipe instructs you to form clay into little round balls, bake them in the oven, and then cover those balls with Armenian ball, egg white, and silver leaf. Now, this process required quite a lot of skill and patience. If you've ever tried gilding, you'll know how difficult it can be to, to get the, the leaf to lay in the way that you'd like it to do. And up close, uh, we weren't very convinced with our imitations. We weren't sure whether the problem was that we didn't have the right skills to replicate the recipe process, whether we lacked the right materials, or perhaps the recipe wasn't very good to begin with. But as we glanced across the table and looked at one another's work, we realized that the counterfeit pearls were remarkably effective at imitating the shine and color of a real pearl at a distance. So here you see that actually, if you're standing across the table and you see those pearls, they look pretty convincing, even though you would never be fooled by examining one up close. Now in the recipe, Cortese suggests that fake pearls might even surpass real pearls in their shape and sheen. And when you compare it with a real pearl, all this list to the eye will seem more beautiful for being more lustrous and more round, she says. She also suggests that you can keep them in little boxes uh, and trick your friends by showing just a few at each time, by treating them as if they're highly valuable, even if they're not. And she says, if you want to profit well, make many of them. Now this comment, I think, hints that there was a profitable market to be had from imitations and buyers and regulators might be concerned about fakes being sold as the real thing. Writing about a secondhand market in mid 17th century Paris, one Dutch traveler warned how shoppers needed to learn to tell the fake from the real. Quote, one sees some fine things, but it is dangerous to buy unless one knows the trade well. You might think you've bought a black coat, but when you take it to the daylight, it might be green or purple or spotted like leopard skin. Now, some guilds restricted their members from working with lesser or mimetic materials in order to protect both buyers and sellers because there could be harsh penalties for damaging your guild's reputation. But other guilds uh, adopted successful stimulants and even spurred off into smaller corporations that specifically focused on making imitation materials, such as the Venetian Supialume makers who controlled the manufacture of blown glass imitation pearls from 1672. So this was quite a lively market, clearly. Most mimetic fashions uh, were probably not designed to mislead the purchaser. I think few people would be duped by a silver leaf pearl up close but they were presumably worn in the hope that they would give a suggestive impression at a short distance. So many men and women were clearly keen to buy imitations that were advertised as such. We've already seen how substitute items could provide fairly convincing alternatives for the middle classes, but even elite men and women could consume them. So when James I was crowned at Westminster, he wore a mix of real and fake gems in his cloth of estate. The invoice for these gems lists topaz, sapphire, emerald, and ruby alongside, and this is a quote, 
stones like topaz, like sapphires, like emeralds, and other made stones. So here, they're similar to the real thing, and they're explicitly noted down as being made. These are artificial, they're not natural. But they are fit for the king, so they are really uh, quite appropriate. The gentleman, Sir Edward Daring, proudly noted down in his account book in January 1626 that he'd purchased two pendant pearls counterfeited. And I think the language used regarding these objects in these kinds of records hints at them being artfully made. They're sometimes so perfect that they can improve on nature. They're made by the most ingenious inventive craftsmen. And these simulations of nature made by skilled human hands were fit for even the most important occasions. Now, courtly splendor in the Renaissance required such a magnificent display of extravagance that Timothy McCall has argued that members of the elite actually needed what he calls material fictions. Uh, he talks about oracalco, which is a kind of brass gold substitute. Um, but we could extend this to think about other, other imitations that we've seen, paste gems, colored foils, fake pearls, in order to create the effect of shimmering brilliance that was expected of the elites on a vast scale. So just looking at one portrait, quite well-known one, of one member of the elite, you can count over a hundred perfectly round shining pearls decorating the hairnet, ears, shoulders, and neck of Eleonora di Toledo, wife of the Duke of Florence, Cosimo de' Medici. Now, Eleonora could afford to wear the finest pearls, but would she have been able to source so many perfectly round pearls in similar sizes? I think reconstructions and archival sources revealing the scale of production interest and consumption of fake materials should make us question what we're really seeing when we look at Renaissance portraits. So Marlesa Reichs has recently argued that educated consumers might have valued counterfeit gems even more than the real thing due to what she terms process appreciation. That is valuing the skills of craftspeople in making one material appear like another. Fake materials were not just profitable for craftsmen who could meet the needs of a market who needed fashionable display. So historians of science might argue that imitating gems and metals could be a means of exploring the natural world by early modern experimenters. This kind of material mimesis, as Marta Imar, Marilyn Ball, and Pamela Smith, among others, have examined, was appreciated as a manifestation of the scientific and artistic fascination of early modern experimenters in pushing the very limits of material properties. Counterfeit corals and jaspers ended up in the most highly esteemed Kunstkammern of Europe. Imitation was not always a cheap and easy option. Reichs has shown that imitation gems could cost almost as much as the real thing because they required more time and effort in the making. But while experimenters and collectors could make an intellectual case for owning fake gold and gemstones to an elite market, most fake fashions, imitation fabrics, clever tailoring, paste gems and copper lace, was probably consumed by non-elite men and women who wished to participate in the culture of fine appearances. When lawmakers attempted to control clothing through sumptuary laws, they might themselves accidentally stimulate the market for fakes. So in Sweden, when sumptuary laws restricted precious stones, gold and silver, women took to wearing imitation jewellery. But in response, new laws were issued forbidding jewellery made of glass too, suggesting that the lawmakers were more concerned about surface appearances than real distinctions in materiality. We find lawmakers specifically calling out fakes as well as real materials across Europe. So a 1551 Spanish law, for example, specifically notes that hats cannot be adorned with gold or silver decoration, even if the gold was fake. In Bologna, 1568 laws banned gold and silver on clothing or accessories, neither good nor false. And pearls were expressly forbidden, neither good nor bad nor false. So I think here, a bad pearl um, is just distinct from a fake pearl. And as we've seen, fake pearls might look better than a bad real pearl, but they're all forbidden under the law. 
So ultimately, I think the anxiety around imitation fashions was less about protecting material integrity of clothing or keeping buyers safe from fraudulent, fraudulent sellers, and more about the desire to be able to trust appearances. Most mimetic fashions, like our reconstructed pearls and stamped velvets, were probably not designed to mislead a purchaser who would have easily spotted the difference up close, but were presumably worn in the hope that they would give a suggestive impression at a short distance. And even this suggestive impression could estab threaten established hierarchies of fashion. Some tree laws encoded the belief neatly summed up by Barnaby Barnes in 1606, that all garments should be neat fit for the body and agreeable to the sex which should wear them, in worth and fashion correspondent to the state, substance, age, place, time, birth, and honest custom of those persons which use them. Imitation fabrics, napped wool hats, and paste jewels that enabled poorer men and women to appear wealthy and of a higher social class threatened the ability of men and women to read one another at a glance across the street as the moralist pamphleteer Philip Stubbs lamented, there is such a confused mingle mangle of apparel, such a horrible excess thereof, that it is very hard to know who is noble, who is worshipful, who is a gentleman, and who is not. Fashion was blamed as a deception in itself, personified in the 1642 French tract La Contre Mode as a tavern wench, the drunken invention of a tramp, a loose chicken-skinned whore who hides her lowly birth. Lift La Mode's mask, and we will see that she is a hideous monster. Now, whether regarded as monstrous hidden inventions or sartorial achievements, early modern fakes made fashion available to a wider range of men and women than ever before, and the material traces and reconstructed examples of these imitations testify to the ingenuity of craftspeople in the 16th and 17th centuries. And as artificial materials could be even more highly valued than the real thing, early modern imitations also put pressure on what we mean when we talk about fake fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, for this fascinating presentation with wonderful illustrations. And uh, first of all, there is a general question from one of our viewers, which is ask, who is asking, how would you differentiate uh, between clothing and fashion? Mm -hmm. in, other, in other words, uh, where does fashion start? That's a great question. Um, I think we see in this period, in, in the 16th and 17th century, um, the idea of, of fashion as meaning a sort of shifting style as something that can change. So not a custom dress that is fixed and associated with a particular kind of person or region, but actually a style that shifts with time. We really see that emerge in the literature. So the word fashion takes on this meaning before then fashion had meant to, to make or create. And actually the, the dual meaning of those words, as I, as I discussed in the presentation, I think actually shows this, this anxiety between what clothing could do uh, and what a, a sh it might shift and change and then you can't rely on it. So we see that the market for a change of style picking up, people are increasingly able to buy more kinds more, more outfits so they might not just own one or two outfits they might own multiple outfits uh, and they might also change what they wear based on just adding more and more accessories this is still too early really to be talking about seasons of fashion uh, so we don't see a kind of annual cycle quite yet but we certainly see this idea that you can't rely on a fixed appearance anymore and so when I talk about fashion versus just clothing, um, what I'm talking about is something that's a little bit fleeting, that's um, a nod to the time and sometimes the place and the culture in which it's in. So that means that fashion is all about appearances. Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Simina Vadika is asking uh, about the artisans who made these forgeries and imitations. Were they looked down upon or were they more or less the same people maybe who work with the original materials? 
It's a great question. Um, and I think it, it depends actually um, at different times. Uh, some of these craftsmen were seen to be the, the best examples of their community. So uh, a very skilled goldsmith who could make um, imitations that were very convincing and then were sold to the elites either for the coronation of James the first or to put in a, in a Kunstkammern collection. This might be the very best of the best um, among the artisans. But also it, this could threaten, it depended on, on what you were making, but a fake uh, item, especially one sold as the real thing, could really threaten the integrity of a guild. We need to remember in this period that guilds controlled most industries, not all, but most trades were controlled by really quite um, organized structures that governed what could what the guilds could sell what kind of quality standards they had to meet at the prices that they were allowed to set and so if one guild member was seen to be defrauding customers not actually revealing that what they were selling was fake that destabilized the integrity of the whole community and so we see people in those cases there are court cases of uh, deceptive craftspeople being thrown out of their guilds, being severely punished um, for, for doing, doing fraudulent, deceptive work. So I think it really depended on whether you were showing that you could imitate and improve on nature, selling something that was an incredibly fine fake. Um, that was a very different case to somebody who was trying to sell something um, that was deceptive. Very interesting, very interesting indeed. And uh, uh, do you have any specific example in mind uh, when a great career of imitations actually threatened uh, the interest of a guild or a group of producers later in the time? Well, I think what we see in Venice, for example, is that these blown glass pearls the makers of those actually split off. They form their own guild because what they're doing in creating these blown glass pearls is actually very different to working with real pearls. It requires totally different skills. Uh, they're used in totally different circumstances. And so we actually see divisions of the guilds, which could be seen as weakening the guild, but in other ways, it strengthens the core community and what they're making. So I think it depends on, on the perspective you see as, as to what, what that means for the guild, but certainly I think um, the kind of increasing craft specialization that we see, the increasing numbers of guilds, the spreading out of skills and the kind of shifting um, approaches and techniques um, is really a feature of the early, early modern craft culture is that, that, that things diversify and some people are uncomfortable with that and others see it as, as something to be celebrated. I think what's what's quite interesting is that often these innovations are made by people who are trying to uh, subvert guild rules. So often um, we see imitation fabrics, for example, are made by immigrants who have fled, for example, one country for another. So Huguenots, for example, come across to, to England, to Norwich, and because they're not allowed to be in the guild because they're, they're foreign, they're not from Norwich, they're not allowed to join the real guilds. So they have to make something that doesn't already fall within the, the laws of the guild. So they have to invent something new. And so they can start working on, they start working on say mock velvets because the real velvet weavers don't consider those part of their own guild. So in some ways, innovation and imitation is driven by the stricter craft regulations. However, once the guilds see that these are competing markets, they sometimes try to absorb them because they want that market or they want to control it, they want to participate in it, or sometimes they, they codify that into a whole new guild. So it, it really depends on, on the, the place and the, the market. But what we, what we see is, is actually innovation driven by some restrictions. By rebels and newcomers. Absolutely. This is interesting. Yeah. They carry the change. And uh, um, talking about pearls, uh, I think it might be interesting for our viewers to learn why actually certain materials or stone uh, became prohibited to be worn at certain periods. Yeah, so I think um, a lot of these materials 
are fairly restricted um, to the middling sorts anyway, particularly uh, in the earlier part of the Renaissance. These are often imported materials, so they're quite hard to get a hold of on the market, even if you had the money for them. So it's not always easy uh, to get, get yourself a ruby or a pearl. Um, however, as the kind of global market opens up um, and these kinds of middling craftspeople, some of them actually make quite a lot of money and they can raise themselves up socially by starting to buy some of these items that previously you could only get your hands on if you were a duke or a king. Actually, now we have this rising uh, sort of upper middling sort who can start accessing these materials too. And because of that, I think the elites want to restrict access to them. They want to keep a hierarchy of materials. Um, but also these materials were seen to have certain powers. Um, they could have medicinal powers. They could have spiritual powers. So I think there's a sense that these are very precious. They should be limited to a small number of people. Um, they're hard to get hold of, but they also then have very important benefits. Um, and so you would want to control that market somewhat. However, um, even, even the kind of similar materials were seen often to have some of those kind of um, numinous properties. So it's interesting, I think, that we, we often see fake gems used in religious objects. It's not a problem to be worshipping with a fake amber rosary, for example. So some of these properties that are associated with the very fine things can transfer down into the imitations um, just with, with no problem. So I think there's an interest in controlling a market in controlling access for very rare materials, but then there's also a sense that that they might communicate more than just splendor. They might be, they might have other powers too. Certain power play through fashion. Um, now uh, a question from Laila Pook. Um, we have a certain respect towards uh, objects which are old. And uh, we are both thinking that was also uh, my question uh, coming from the museum field. Um, and now I quote uh, how Laia put it, puts it. Uh, you've mentioned that there are objects in museums which are made of non-identified materials. Could you explain some example of this? And uh, then I would develop it. Actually, did you discover many labels that had to be rewritten after your research? It's a great question. I mean, the, the challenge I think often is that, that in a museum, you, you might have thousands of objects in the stores that as a curator, you, you don't have much time to really examine very up close. You've got to care for a very wide range of things. And so you might just glance at something and think, okay, I know what that is. That's a piece of silk velvet, that's a gold ring. And you don't necessarily have the time or the money to do the scientific testing to really check if you can believe what your eyes are telling you. Um, so a project like, mine in looking into imitation materials where I do have more time. I have studied um, the, the kind of archival records that tell me that these objects exist. I can start going and looking and, and I'm, I'm really not trusting my eyes. Um, and so I have um, sort of pulled out some objects in some museums that I assume or I have some hint that they might be not quite what the label says. But then I have to get permission um, if the museum wants to test those objects um, and then pay. And it can be very expensive and sometimes destructive to the object to do that kind of scientific testing. So sometimes you need to, to actually remove um, a piece of material, um, which can be all right if that object is shedding a little bit. Um, but sometimes it actually, you can't do it. It's too precious to do that. Um, if you can then test them, then you actually have a sort of scientific proof of what, what it is that you're looking at. And it can be very surprising. Um, that then some museums will feed that back in and put it on their labels. Others don't want to know. Um, I mean, I suppose what, what I'm talking about is not usually the finest example of an object in a museum. It's not like telling a museum that the, the Leonardo they have on their wall is fake, right? Just telling them that a small scrap of, of velvet is not silk, but it's actually wool. I mean, that doesn't really change the, the market value of that piece, and they weren't likely to sell it either. 
So I think most museums are very interested. Um, they just don't have the chance to look at those things directly themselves. And others sort of reveal themselves over time. So for example, gold, you know, wouldn't tarnish in the way that copper would. So it might have been acquired as gold, but it might change over time. Uh, I think what's what's particularly a challenge is if you want to find a fake or an imitation on the market, uh, it's very <laughs> most auction houses wouldn't wouldn't want to advertise that, or it simply wouldn't have been valuable enough to be saved in the very first place. So I think many of these imitation materials were never collected. They were, you know, used. They were worn up. Um, they were worn out. Sorry, and they were probably either they fell apart or they were just thrown away because they weren't as valuable as the real gold, the real silk. Um, so I think some are hidden in plain sight. I definitely think that there are lots of museums that have have just not been discovered yet. Um, so for example, those, those beaver hats, um, unless there was a project that was gonna start testing all the beaver hats, we don't really know whether they're made of sheep's wool or beaver fur or, or another kind of animal hair or fur. And actually, even then, it's quite hard to tell. So you can tell, for example, that it's from an animal, but you have to take a decent sample to know which animal, and it really requires a lot of expertise. Um, so yeah, we'll look at them and we'll say, this could be this or that, but does it really matter? If it works on an optical level, um, then we know that it, it, it was giving a certain effect, even if we don't really know the substance it's made of. So it's a great question, but I, I do think we should we should not always trust our eyes um, when we look at objects and when we look at paintings. You know, don't don't quite be so uh, ready to believe that that they're really wearing a pearl or a beaver hat. It might be something that looks like a pearl or a beaver hat. I think that's much more fun to to imagine. It opens up far more possibilities. And uh, actually, uh, referring to question from uh, Callum Coates, um, uh, which uh, in which uh, there is a mention about a bath coat that was always assumed to be leather, but analysis proved is to be heavily felted wool. Um, and uh, would this coat uh, be described as fake or uh, an innovative use of an alternative material? What is the uh, difference between and how you trace if the object is, uh, uh, well, um, innovative uh, new um, technology, an example of this, or uh, if it was meant to be imitation? It's a great question. Um, I think this is where we have to turn to the more traditional textual sources if we really want to know whether something is is considered innovative or imitative or just a distinct category of its own. But that's so difficult. Um, you know, when you look at an inventory, you don't have usually the very objects to which they refer next to you. So you're having to make the connection between an object that you see in a, in a collection and a textual record of an object. Very rarely do you have both those sources next to each other. Um, so, I think it's an open question in many cases is, is what you're looking at supposed to be a fake or is it a whole new category of material? And the category of fakes that I've presented today is in many ways anachronistic as I tried to show the language around these imitations is very complicated. They can be seen as artificial, as counterfeit, as imitation, as like something else, as a made version of something else. Um, this language is not always kind of a binary fake versus real, a, 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 you know, bad versus good. It's, it's much more complicated than that. So this kind of category is something that anachronistically as historians, we're applying we're with our 21st century eyes back into the past. And we see that it doesn't match so so cleanly with our understanding of fake and real. Um, and I hope what I've shown today is that it's not always a negative attribute for something to be to be fake. Um, in fact, they don't use the word fake very often. It's it's much more frequently a counterfeit or an imitation or sort of man-made um, sort of these kinds of words are more frequently applied. So yes, it's a real challenge when we look at surviving objects to really be able to understand in in the contemporary 
world of that object, what, what it would have meant to viewers. But I do think that we can sometimes, um, if we use other sources in concert with, with that piece, understand that it might have been seen as a, a lesser substitute for or a simulation of, um, particularly in, in things like account books um, or even in letters, things like that. We sometimes get good examples of that. And then certainly in recipe books that quite explicitly will tell you how certain things are, have been made and what they're supposed to look like. Um, but in this case, yeah, the jury's out. And I think it in that in if if we kind of flip that on its head and turn it not from a problem but into an opportunity, I think it can really stimulate kind of conversations about, you know, what do we mean when we when we think about fakes um, and materials and what can we see with our eyes, what can what what do we have to rely on other senses for? Um, and how how do clothes and, and jewels operate? Are we just trusting our eyes or do we want something to feel like the real thing? Do we want it to smell like the real thing, move like the real thing, as well as just looking like the real thing? Mm -hmm. uh, now I will uh, pose the last question from the audience uh, from Cup. Uh, what advice uh, would you have for anyone who wants to recreate clothes as part of academic research or even just a hobby? How can one learn this craft? Um... That's a great question um, and one I, I love to hear because I, I really believe that doing hands-on uh, engagement with objects is really helpful for anybody who works with the past, uh, works with objects because it gives you a sensitivity for materials. It gives you respect for craftspeople um, and it makes you ask new questions of your sources, both the material sources and the textual and the visual ones. So my first tip is to just have a go, to not be too intimidated by, by it. Um, it's a learning process for all of us. So I've been doing reconstructions for a number of years now. I would certainly not say that I am expert at anything. Um, so the, the first thing is to just be open-minded and have a go, maybe start small, um, try to try to do something um, that you can manage at home in a kitchen. Um, try to do things that are safe because many reconstructions require you to be in a well ventilated area or working with with fire or other kinds of toxic materials. So start safe. Uh, maybe try some natural dyeing at home or try some sewing um, and just see how it makes you feel. Try to think about your body. What kind of tools you're working with, do you think those tools are like the historic tools? Can you find tools and materials that you think are similar to the ones that were used in the historic period that you're studying? I, I think a great place to start is often using those early modern books of secrets or recipe books from whatever period you're interested in because that gives you a text to rely on. We, most of us know how to follow a cookbook and it's not that different. Uh, but it's always fascinating when you actually try to recreate something, not just read it, but try to do it to see what knowledge is assumed of you. Um, what, what are the gaps in that recipe? Um, and just take it from there. You can also look at a surviving object and then see if you can replicate that. But that requires a whole new level of skill. So that would be one tip would be, you know, don't be too ambitious, start small, be safe. The other tip I would give everybody doing this, whether you are an expert at a particular craft or a complete amateur, is whatever you do, document your process. Take lots of photos, take lots of notes, because often you'll find that you'll want, once you finish, you'll want to start all over again because you've learned so much from the process that you'll know much better how to do it a second time. And if you've documented your process, um, you'll be very, pleased that you have records to come back to. If you think you'll remember to do it differently another time, you won't, you'll forget. Um, and you'll always want to photograph of something that you have forgotten to photograph. So video everything, photograph everything, take copious notes, uh, because it's very easy to forget, uh, to get carried away with the hands-on and forget what you're doing. So those are my two key tips. Um, but yeah, and then share, because there's a big community of makers online, then there are academics, but there are also huge communities of craftspeople, reenactors, 
um, professional makers who have done their own research into history. Um, and you can get a mine, a, a, a complete wealth of, of information by going on YouTube, on Facebook groups, by talking to people online um, and sort of thinking outside the kind of academic bubble and reaching way beyond. Um, so engage with the community too. Wow, I think that uh, your lecture and uh, hints that you gave inspired many, many people who are interested in historical reenactment and uh, in craft to, to discover a new passion. This is amazing. <laughs> and uh, well, to finish, uh, because uh, I can see that uh, our time is, um, is running very quickly. Uh, I would like to a bit uh, go back to what you said about different categories, category of fakes. And um, uh, we were, when we were uh, talking before the lecture, you also mentioned that uh, our exhibition in Brussels, Fake for Real, uh, presents another, uh, actually, as you said, totally new category of fakes, so-called ethical fakes, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So in the exhibition, um, there's this idea of the ethical fake. And I think a lot of us um, would prefer to have a fake fur than a real fur or fake leather, perhaps. Um, we want the look of the fur, the feel of the fur, but we don't want to think about um, or participate in the, the killing of the animal um, that the fur was taken from or the leather, for example. This idea of, of ethical fakes, I think, is, is very contemporary. It's, it's to our 21st century sensibilities. There wasn't necessarily this sense of ethical fakes when early modern people imitated fake fur. So we do have records of how to fake leopard fur. But I don't think it was because they were concerned about killing a leopard to decorate their gown, for example. It was because in Europe, it was incredibly hard to get your hands on a leopard. So instead, you know, you had to make do with what you had to hand. Um, nevertheless, I think there were some ethical concerns about, about certain practices, certainly toxic practices, um, but I'm not sure that this category of ethical fake we can, we can transpose onto the past. But I think it's another, another way of thinking about fashion materials that takes us, you know, right into the 21st century. We're not always so concerned now with the law or the price of things, um, but we are concerned about consuming in a responsible way. Um, and in, in that sense, uh, the, the story of fashion and fakes kind of can continue on into the future um, and, and means that we can have some sympathy with people who actually prefer a fake man-made material um, to, to the real thing, because we often do ourselves. Amazing. So maybe counterfeit becomes an art again. Absolutely. To save the planet. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, to all of you, uh, dear viewers, uh, I would just uh, like to remind you that our exhibition Fake for Real, a history of forgery and falsification is still open until the end of January.